team asking, where's the money? They're committed to helping you with all things economic related during this ongoing coronavirus pandemic. And we invite you to join us on this social stream for a two screen experience. So as you're watching along tonight on WCNC Charlotte Television, you can check back in with us here during the commercial breaks for real time questions and answers with some of your favorite defenders, including Bill McGinty, Nate Morabito and Savannah Levins. They'll be right here no matter where you're watching on WCNC.com on the WCNC mobile app. Maybe you're tuned in with us on Facebook, Twitter, Periscope or Twitch. We're very happy you are here with us and uh, we're going to get started with tonight's presentation in just a moment. Again, it's an hour with our WCNC Defenders team. They're dedicated to helping you with all things economic related here during this coronavirus pandemic. They have helped so many of you already by answering your questions about stimulus checks and PPP loans and helping you manage your finances, whether it's back to school or paying your taxes or paying your rent, they are here to help with all of that. So in just a moment, we will kick that off. We want to invite you to use the comment field here on YouTube or Facebook or wherever it is you're watching to join tonight's conversation so that our defenders, our experts can answer those questions for you coming up throughout the hour right here online and on air. A special presentation from WCNC Charlotte and our defenders is coming your way in just moments. Thanks so much for tuning in online and on social with us this evening. Families across the Carolinas struggling in the coronavirus economy. I don't see a very uh, hopeful future. The people are out of work, bills are overdue, and time is running out. People are scared. People are extremely scared. Tonight, we're with you and want to help. From paying rent and budgeting your money to getting your lost stimulus check, we have a team of experts to help guide you through this economic downturn. This special edition of WCNC Charlotte, Where's the Money, starts right now. Thanks for joining us tonight, everybody. I'm Sarah French. And I'm Fred Shropshire. We're going to cover a lot of ground in the next hour, including how to get help paying your mortgage or rent. We'll talk about those stimulus checks, what you should do and if yours hasn't arrived, and the new push for another round of checks. We'll also talk live with an expert about navigating the job market in the virtual environment and someone who got rid of $300,000 of debt. She has some advice on budgeting for you. We also have some options if you need help paying your bills. First, before we get into all of that, how did we get here? The reopening of the economy is a complicated issue and it's important to understand what's happened so far and the challenge ahead. Think of it like a spigot. Turn it on all the way and growth inevitably follows. Last year's water flowed freely. Our economy grew $21.2 trillion worth of goods and services. And then this year, a virus began turning our daily personal interactions into a poison. Worried about infections overwhelming the medical system, states started closing the spigot in an effort to choke the virus. A once roaring economy turned into a trickle and unemployment surged by 22 million in just four weeks. This is the reality governors now face as they contemplate how far to turn the spigot, how much to reopen the economy. The first turns are likely to be slow, measured. Some businesses would reopen, but not all. Many who work at home would still work at home. Here's the problem. Turn it too much and the virus has room to return. Hospitalizations and deaths could spike once again. Turn it too little and the economy continues to sputter. Unemployment fails to go down. More businesses close for good. It's why you're likely to see incremental turns of that spigot. Turn it a little, see what happens. Turn it a little more, see what happens. Find the right amount of turning to grow the economy, not the virus. A challenge indeed for an economy in need of so much more than a trickle to keep it going. I love those explainer stories, Fred. They always make it so where you can understand it visually. Yeah, and that's what we're here to do tonight so you can understand what we're going through and know that we are here to help you. Right now, we have a running poll asking how the coronavirus has affected your job. Head over to WCNC.com slash vote to weigh in. So when it comes to paying your bills, the biggest one for most of us is our mortgage or our rent. And in these tough financial times, it can be the hardest to pay. So tonight, Bill McGinty has some advice and some of your options. Let's tackle rent first. Little known fact, but 43 million of us are renters nationwide. So I went to an expert. So really it's shifting right now to more financial things. 
Brian Carberry is known as the rent advice guy for Apartment Guide, and he's been busy. What are you telling people who are having a tough time paying their rent right now? What, what, how, what do you say? You know, if you are having a tough time paying rent, you know, due to financial difficulties you might be facing as, as a result of being furloughed or losing your job, really the first and best thing that you can do is go to your landlord and let them know the situation that you're in. Explain to them, you know, what your financial situation is or your employment situation. You don't have to be too detailed, but at least let them know, hey, my hours have been cut or my wages have been cut and the rent amount that I have, it might be challenging for me to, to meet that amount each month. Ask them for their suggestions and their guidance of what they're going to do or what they might be willing to do. Brian suggests offering up a payment plan. And remember that security deposit, first and last month's rent? Well, you can use that or some of it if they'll let you. Get creative and ask, but don't just stop paying. You'll hurt your credit and end up evicted eventually. All right, now let's talk mortgage payments. At Bank of America, you can extend your 90-day mortgage payment deferral for an additional 90 days. You don't need any documentation of job loss, and there is no cost associated with this option. Most banks and most lenders have similar options, but you've got to ask. And if you hear the word forbearance, don't get it confused with forgiveness. It means deferred to a later agreed-upon date. At Truist Bank, it means three options, a loan modification, a repayment plan, or repayment at the end of the loan. Basically, they just tack it on to the end. And Bill joins us live now. Bill, first, let's tackle rent. Are landlords being flexible, and what advice do you have for someone who's renting? Yeah, you know, Fred, over the last four or five months, however long this has gone on, landlords have been extremely flexible. You've even heard of some landlords waiving the rent altogether for, for months at a time. That's not everybody. So if you're having trouble paying your rent, or if you think you might have trouble paying the rent down the road, it's very, very important that you open up a line of dialogue and communication with your landlord, whether it be a corporate landlord or whether it's just the guy on the other side of the duplex who owns the building uh, or the house and you rent the other side. People would rather get something than nothing these days. There's a lot of flexibility and a lot of creativity. You know, we talked there a moment ago about the security deposit. You know, when you move in, you give the first months, last months in some cases, but you also give a damage deposit. That money's just sitting there. So ask if it can be put to use. That's probably the best advice for renters. Certainly do not stop paying. If you stop paying without any communication whatsoever and there's no protections in place, they can actually go ahead and begin um, eviction process. And we don't want to do that. How, let's go back to mortgages. I didn't realize that you could no. extend to a 90 day asking your mortgage company, your bank, uh, to do that for you. How flexible are the banks? Well, it's not a one size fits all. You probably heard me say that a couple of times here before. You know, what advice I would give out right now for those of you that have Bank of America mortgages, I'd be alienating everybody else. And so the best advice I can give you is, again, open up the lines of communication and dialogue with whatever bank you have. If you have to go in and see them face to face and wear a mask, go do it. But don't give up trying. It's very, very important. There's lots of flexibility there. You just have to get in touch with them. Yeah, you'll never know unless you ask. All right, Bill, thank you. And if you have a question for Bill or any of our Where's the Money experts, you can ask them on our YouTube stream or Facebook page. We have interactive behind the scenes coverage in the next hour. Just search for WCNC Charlotte. Sarah. All right, turning now to those stimulus checks. If you're one of the millions who still have not received your check, it might be because someone falsely claimed you as a dependent. It turns out this is happening more than you might think. WCNC Charlotte defender Savannah Levins has the story. Imagine needing it for an emergency and you go to get it and someone claims you. Malia Habish says that's exactly what happened to her. A working student laid off for over a month due to the pandemic. She was eager to receive her $1,200. So I went to get my stimulus check or do the application for so and I got news back that someone claimed me on their taxes. She says she later found out it was a non-immediate family member. Uh, I needed the money and had no access to it because she had claimed me on her taxes and without telling I started crying because it's so stressful 
not being able to access something that is meant to help people during this time. I just felt heartbroken almost. It's like, how does your family member do something like that without your knowledge? That's something that should be told to you. I have spoken to several individuals who were claimed as a dependent by a family member without their knowledge. Sori Finley, senior attorney for the Charlotte Center for Legal Advocacy, says many people are discovering they won't be getting a check for exactly that reason. Often, some people don't know that they were claimed as a dependent, specifically when it comes to Social Security recipients. Finley says if this happens to you, you can take immediate action. They can file what is called a superseding tax return. In other words, they can file their 2019 tax return. Basically, they, they can put the zeros that would audit the taxpayer who claimed them and incentivize them to not claim that person again in the future. She says any former dependents who file their 2020 tax return will be eligible to receive their $1,200 stimulus check next year. Savannah Levins, WCNC Charlotte. And Savannah joins us live now. So Savannah, you've been covering stimulus concerns for months now. What other issues are you seeing most often? Sarah, far and away, the biggest issue is people saying they're going to the IRS, get my payment tool on the IRS website, and they're seeing payment status not available, those dreaded words. And they think that it means they're not getting a check at all if they're still seeing that. Well, the good news is that's not necessarily true. Experts I spoke with say if you're seeing that message, payment status not available, it probably just means that your payment information hasn't processed yet, your check information hasn't processed yet, but that it probably still will. So still will so just be a little bit patient that excuse me will likely still come through uh, the other big issue is a lot of people think that they accidentally tossed out their payments a lot of people were mailed physical checks some other people were mailed debit cards and they really came in these kind of inconspicuous envelopes that kind of did look like junk mail so a lot of people reported that they just tossed it the good news there is if you think you did that if you know you did that you can call a certain line on the IRS a phone number they'll cancel that card and issue you a new one we have that information in the WCNC app and on our website. And one final note for everyone who's really worried that they're not going to get their checks. If something does go wrong and you don't get it for whatever reason, you will, if you're eligible for the stimulus check, you will get it when you file your taxes in 2020. Right now, it's just kind of, you know, an early uh, tax credit. So when you file your taxes next year, you will still get that check. Of course, that's not good news for people who really need it now. And there are so many people who are struggling day to day. And so we get why this is frustrating. But just hopefully you can uh, feel good about the fact that, uh, you know, in the knowledge that you will get that money money eventually. But Sarah, those are really the biggest stimulus related questions we're getting. We have tons more information on all of this on our website and again in the WCNC app. A lot of great information there. Savannah, thank you so much for that report. Fred, over to you. All right. Well, there's a lot to talk of a second round stimulus checks and lawmakers in Washington are working on it right now. Vanessa Rufus shows us what it could look like. Not much is known about how the second stimulus would work, but we do know that the president and lawmakers on both sides of the aisle are in favor of a second round. We've heard your stories. I still have bills. I've maxed out my credit cards. I've used up my savings. Um, it's just hard. So we are rolling into another month and there's still no money. Carolinians out of work, down to their last dollars, needing help. Many eyes on Washington now as talk over additional direct payments to Americans heightens. I, I think the president's been very clear that he's supportive of another stimulus uh, check. In mid-May, House Democrats passed the HEROES Act. It would have offered a second round of stimulus, but it was a non-starter in the Senate. Now Republican leadership is taking Taking it shot. It'll be very carefully crafted. It won't be three trillion dollar left wing wish list like the House cobbled together. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell says aid should target those making forty thousand dollars a year or less. But a cutoff like that would need Democratic support. I think families making over forty thousand dollars probably need assistance. Again, just depending on their family situation. And we also know that nothing is coming in the next couple of weeks. The Senate is on recess until the 20th. Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin says the goal is to have bipartisan talks then and then pass something by the end of the month. Vanessa Rufus, WCNC Charlotte. Still to come, black business owners getting the short end of the stick. I need that money and I need it now.
now. I needed it yesterday. Why so many are waiting for critical federal loans to stay afloat. And next, with so many people out of work, we'll tell you how to make your resume stand out and strengthen your online presence. Our special edition of WCNC Charlotte, Where's the Money? continues after the break. And welcome back to our special online expanded coverage of Where's Your Money? I'm James Briarton from WCNC Charlotte. We just had Savannah uh, on the air telling you about all of her reporting, and she joins us now with a little bit more insight. So, Savannah, uh, you wrote a very detailed resource guide for the Where's the Money section, wcnc.com slash money. Tell us what's in there. You know, James, this is one of those tricky topics where so many people were writing into us saying, I, I can't find my stimulus check. I can't get an update. I have no idea where it is. I still haven't received it. And the tough part about it is just as everyone else is having a hard time reaching the IRS, we were too. So it is really hard to kind of on an individual basis, figure out where everyone's checks are. And that's why it's so frustrating. But I did make uh, this guide where, you know, as we were getting these questions, I just kind of went through the most common issues. Uh, so, you know, reading off of it right now, again, like I just mentioned on air, the biggest the biggest number one far and away uh, question we're getting is I'm logging into the IRS get my payment tool, which by the way, if you don't know what that is and you haven't gotten your check yet, go check that right away. It's irs.gov click get my payment. You just plug in your information and it should pull up the status of your check. But a lot of people are getting this message that says payment status not available. And they're thinking that that means that they're not going to get a check. That's not necessarily true. A few things could be happening. First, you didn't plug your information in correctly as the government has it. So you have to look the past two years exactly how your address was written as you filed your taxes. That's how you need to plug in your address to the Get My Payment tool. So a lot of people have reported that little tweaks here and there have gotten them in to the tool. For instance, like street was abbreviated ST instead of spelled out S-T-R-E-E-T. -E -E and over time, these are things that the IRS, you know, team has kind of tried to fix a little bit to make it not so nuanced. But if you're not able to get that tool, doing little things like that might help. A good way to do it is to go to USPS. Uh, they have an address finder tool. So you can plug in your address and USPS will basically bring it up exactly how they have it in the system with a specific zip code and all that. So that might be a good way to do that USPS zip code lookup tool uh, to go do that and find out your exact address. But it's really just playing around. Some people even reported using capital letters instead of lowercase work for them. So anyway, I want to move on before, uh, before yeah, we're we going to rejoin this. We're going to rejoin the special about 45 seconds. want to let people okay. know as you're watching with us here online, we have Savannah and Bill and Nate for the hour. So comment with your questions for them. WCNC.com slash money has more of Savannah's tips. And if you find one that works, Savannah, they'll give you a shout and let you know. Let's go back over to Fred. Oh, please. Yeah. <laughs> Like I said, lots of questions, so bring them on. The people out of work in the Carolinas. In North Carolina, the unemployment rate is almost 13%. In South Carolina, it's 12.5%. So if you're out of work, like so many are, how can you stand out to get the next interview? Joining us live is Kimberly Harris, owner of the Career Center of the Southeast. Thank you for joining us, Kimberly. Thank you for having me. How do you navigate the job market using a virtual environment these days? Oh, wow. Well, you know, the job search is so different now. We are hosting virtual career fairs for job and career seekers across the country. So you're going to prepare just like a typical career fair, update that resume, get in touch, get to know the virtual environment, make sure your speakers, the cameras are on, um, research your company. So some of the old school techniques are still working, but again, preparing yourself um, with the technology and getting comfortable with your computer and everything everything that goes with it. I've heard about reinventing ourselves even when we're employed gainfully. How do you go about doing something like that professionally for yourself these days? 
But reinventing yourself, what you're going to do is definitely ask yourself some questions. What are your priorities? What's next for you? Identifying and transferable skills. We work with job and career seekers every day, and they have so much experience that's not showcased on that resume. So you definitely want to showcase the transferable skills and understand and realize and discover what's next for you in your career path and make sure you are that thought expert. All right, very important. Kimberly Harris of the Career Center of the Southeast. Thank you so much. And after Thank the break, you. tracking your tax dollars, black owned businesses in the Carolinas are not getting the help they need to stay afloat. We're asking why this is happening. And later, a woman pays off $300,000 of debt. She tells us the tricks you need to know to get your budget on track. And we're back online with you here. Uh, you're watching uh, WCNC Charlotte's Where's the Money? Bill McGinty joins me now. Bill, at the top of the program tonight, uh, you had some good tips for people paying rent and mortgage online. I'm wondering if there's there's more you can elaborate for our audience uh, watching right now on Facebook, YouTube, and online. Well, one of the things that I would definitely say is pe people sometimes tend to have a beef with their landlord. Uh, and this is specifically for landlords and so for renters, but people tend, who tend to have a beef think, well, if, I, if I'm not getting the service that I'm paying for, I'm just going to stop paying. Mm -hmm. And that's that's not a good thing to do. And this this is a consumer issue that I've dealt with for the last 10 years. So <clears throat> my advice to you is if you're having financial trouble or if you're just in a squabble or a beef with your landlord and you want to use COVID as an excuse not to pay, you have to open up a, a, a stream of dialogue with them so that uh, they can't evict you because if you just stop paying, they can start eviction proceedings. Now, there was a temporary freeze on evictions and, and that bounces around from state to state and county to county. And so for me to just give you blanket information about one or the other would be, uh, would be erroneous. So whatever county you're watching us in, if you're a renter and you're having problems, you got to find out what the rules and the regulations are in your particular county and all that's available uh, on, on your county website when it comes to landlords and things like that. So, but, but if you're having trouble paying because of COVID or because of job loss or anything like that, absolutely open up a, open up a, a stream of dialogue with your landlord, whether it's the guy next door who owns the duplex. I said this earlier, mm -hmm. uh, maybe he lives on one side, she lives on one side, maybe you live on the other, uh, talk to them and find out what can be done if you lost your job or if you think you're going to lose your job or if you've been furloughed and you had a pay cut, just open up the lines of dialogue. Even if it's a corporate entity and you live in an apartment complex, do the very same thing. Go into the office, show your face, and pay whatever you can. Um, but, but act in good faith. That's very, very important. If they see you acting in good faith and you're paying something, then more likely they're going to work with you. Bill, in the next 45 seconds, before we go back to Fred and Sarah, tell us what's coming up from you later on in the program because you have more financial tips for people. Uh, you know, James, uh, I, I don't have a, 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 a final rundown of what's coming up in the show here in front of me, but yeah. I can tell you we've got a lot of financial advice going forward. Um, things that you should be thinking about, even resume help uh, if you lost your job, things like that that are going to be very, very important going forward. Yeah. Uh, you know, there are resume services that you can actually go out and hire, and, and they can be very, very beneficial. I have never heard from anybody that has used one and has said that was a waste of my money. So going forward, if you lose your job, you may want to think about that. We're going to be talking about resumes here on TV in just a few minutes. Yeah, let's rejoin them. Our Defenders team keeping tabs on the money from the federal government during the coronavirus pandemic. Right now, we want to focus on the Paycheck Protection Program. Among the applicants who documented their race, Black-owned businesses in the Carolinas secured just 3% of those loans worth $150,000 or more. The Defenders' Nate Morbido is asking, where's the money? Coretta Livingston owns an event space. She gets a paycheck by helping people celebrate their happiest times. I don't even have any fingernails in, at this point, and I don't even bite my nails. But COVID-19 has sucked away much of her joy and business. Actually, I owe more than that 16000 Replacing it with stress and debt. I need that money, and I need it now. I needed it yesterday. Enter the Paycheck Protection Program, initially denied for a government loan. It's been very frustrating. 
Livingston said her event business recently received approval. I was elated. But unfortunately, she's still waiting for the $16,000 to arrive. And as soon as I can put it in my hands, I'll be the happiest young lady probably in Charlotte. We know other black-owned small businesses in Charlotte secured smaller PPP loan approval, too. But federal records show few received loans of $150,000 or more. Of the more than 2,000 small business owners in North and South Carolina who identified their race in their PPP applications, minorities remained in the minority. Only 64 of them black. 64 out of 2,000. NAACP President Corinne Mack said investing money in black communities is critical to ensuring equity. That's how you create change. Your words mean nothing. They're empty if there's no action behind the words. Mack said these PPP records are indicative of a national problem, a failure to prioritize black-owned businesses. Are we invisible? Does that pain not feel like pain to some folks? When we cry, do you not see our tears? This is a serious problem. And it's not just in Charlotte. Back in Charlotte's historic West End. I probably know maybe six people who've received the actual money. Coretta Livingston is still waiting on her loan. And it's almost like the big companies, they didn't have to wait. They got their money. They started spending it immediately, right? And making more money. People like me were still waiting. And while she waits, her vendors wait to get paid too. All she can do is try to stay patient and positive. As soon as I get it, I'm going to send you a text and let you know the eagle has finally landed. <laughs> Nate Morabito, WCNC Charlotte. And Nate, the disproportionate loans given to minorities isn't the only thing you've discovered here. Fred, it's just so frustrating for so many of our neighbors. You know, one of the things I'm most proud of over this pandemic is that our reporting has made a difference for some of these people. We helped a man who had to wait 34 days for a PPP loan, a small business owner in Salisbury. Once we got involved, he received a $72,000 loan almost instantly. Now, our reporting also prompted Congresswoman Alma Adams and more than a dozen members of Congress to write a letter calling for a formal audit, a formal review, an oversight review of the PPP program based on several issues. Number one, the delays. It wasn't just that man in Salisbury. We found other businesses, including Central Coffee, a popular coffee spot in Charlotte, that waited multiple weeks to get a PPP loan, something that should take reasonably 10 days or less. There was an assisted living facility in Rowan County that had to wait several weeks. This is, a, this is a place that's trying to keep its residents safe, trying to get PPE for its staff and pay them overtime. That's the delays. We also know people like Coretta Livingston there in Historic West End were denied initially when they applied. The Historic West End, predominantly a black neighborhood. And I also should point out several large businesses received PPP loans. We had to search through SEC records to find them, and we found at least 15 in North Carolina. Some had more than 500 employees. They documented more than 500 employees. A handful gave that money back. But you have delays, you have denials, and then you have money that's supposed to go to small businesses going to large businesses. Wow disproportionate distribution of that money. Nate Morbido showing us where's the money. Thank you, Nate. And if you have a question for Nate or any of our where's the money experts, you can ask them on our YouTube stream or Facebook page. We have interactive behind the scenes coverage during this hour. And right now on our website, WCNC.com, we have a section dedicated to economic needs during the pandemic. We can send you a direct link to all of that information. Just text the word money to 704-329-3600. Sarah. Still to come, if you've fallen behind paying your bills, there's some help. Bill McGinty got a look at what options are available for you. And coming up next, paying down your debt. A woman pays off $300,000 in three years. We'll ask her how she did it and the tips you need to know if you need to get out of the red. Welcome back, WCNC Charlotte's Where is the Money? We're with you tonight online, WCNC.com, the mobile app, Facebook, and YouTube. I'm James Briarton from WCNC's digital team, and I'm joined now by Nate Morabito. Nate, tell us more about the reaction you got from your reporting on the PPP loan. Yes, yeah, so this Paycheck Protection Program, really, I, I started getting interesting, interested in this a couple months ago when a man in Salisbury, I mentioned him just on the news a few minutes ago in the special, uh, told me he'd been waiting for a month for his PPP loan to be approved. A month. This is a man that like had a handful of employees. He was desperate for the money and he needed the money right then and he wasn't getting it. And it was mostly tied up 
between his bank and the federal government, really. Those are the two key players here. He said he did everything right. He used a large bank, which I think was part of the problem in hindsight. They were overwhelmed early on. Um, but it was just so outrageous to me, the fact that this man had to wait. So we instantly got involved with him. We were able to help him get a $72,000 loan really quickly. But as I investigated it further, I, I realized that there were so many small businesses that were just like this. So Representative Alma Adams, when we brought this to her attention, she told me 10 days or less. That really, when, when Congress approved this program, that was the, the reasonable assumption that your loans would be turned around quickly. And what we're finding is just people were waiting kind of forever for this. Like every day that goes by, you, you get further and further behind in this pandemic economically. And that was number one. But then we started finding out that really Charlotte's acceptance rate really wasn't that great. Initially, more people were getting denied than approved. We knew that uh, historically black area of Charlotte, historic West End, about 100 people got it denied initially. It took a community bank, URI Bank, stepping in to try to help a lot of those people get their loans. Some of them are still waiting. Coretta Livingston, you heard in the special a few minutes ago. She was approved and she's still waiting on the money. She, she had to return so many checks for deposits for her event space. And she's also losing the revenue from actually renting that out. And she owes people money. Like It's not like she needs the money for herself. She owes people money. And it almost came to fisticuffs to some degree between her and one of her vendors. She had to show the person her bank account to prove that she hadn't received the money yet. So denials, delays. And then you had this whole overarching issue that really has irritated people more than anything. While these people were waiting, while they were getting denied, these large companies, these publicly traded companies that are traded, their stocks are traded, were getting these PPP loans rather quickly. We found, looking through Securities and Exchange Commission records, at least 15 in North Carolina that received PPP loans. Now, some of them had a small workforce. They came off like a small business. But generally, if you're publicly traded, you have some capital. You have better accessibility to a lender and to getting a loan potential potentially. But what you found were some of these companies documented more than 500 employees. Now that's by definition, not a small business. Um, and so that was a real issue early on too. And Nate, we're gonna leave it there for a minute. We'll be back with some you of the businesses in a moment. For joining us tonight for this special edition of WCNC Charlotte, Where's the Money? I'm Sarah French. And I'm Fred Shropshire. With so many people out of work, it is important to manage debt and not let your spending get out of control, whether it's credit cards or student loans. Getting out of that debt hole is so important for financial freedom. Joining us live now is Bernadette Joy, the founder of Debt Crushers. Bernadette, uh, thank you for joining us. Your debt Thank crushers, you so much for having me. Oh, absolutely. Your debt crushers have paid off more than $160,000 since March. How are they doing it? Yes, they are doing it by exactly what you said. Two things. One, they are taking really good care of being um, wise about their spending and cutting expenses where they don't need it. And instead of just uh, you know letting that money lie around, they're taking that and flipping it over into their debt and paying off debt. And so I've been super proud of them. They've done over $150,000, even with COVID happening right now. Wow, and we emphasize saving so much, but should we focus on paying off debt or should we focus on saving? That is a great question. When I first started doing the debt crushers, my initial focus was, was entirely on debt. But what I found was that a lot of people who were on this debt journey, even before COVID, had a hard time saving money, and especially for emergencies. So while a lot of my debt crushers have uh, paid off debt, I've had a lot of them focus on saving up for their emergency funds. And so one of the focuses I tell people is to really have at least a 30-day emergency fund before you tackle your debt. Hmm. All right, good advice. And you talk about money less from the math part and more from the emotional part. Why? Yeah, so what I have learned, especially with women, is that, you know, all of the traditional advice of just do the math and you'll be fine with your money just didn't resonate with me. And I found that to be true with a lot of the other people that I work with. And so what I really uh, do is what I call money planning for humans, where I'm asking people to not only focus on the mathematical part of this, but how do, you know, debt and saving money really play into your emotions and specifically not letting shame and blame be the reason that you pay off debt, but that you're really motivated for what you want your future to be. And what should someone do if they don't have extra money to pay off debt? 
Yes, and there's a lot of people in that scenario right now, and that is exactly why I talk about you know handling your emotions and and figuring out what you can do and what's in your control. So even if you don't have a lot of money to put towards debt right now, and maybe you're saving up for your emergency fund, you can still start to streamline your expenses and your accounts. So one of the biggest tips I can give people right now is that instead of focusing on just the amount, focus on the number of things that you have to track financially. So for example, I have a debt crusher who had 12 different debt accounts that she had to figure out what the passwords were and all of the things that she had to figure out. And so what we worked on together, even though she didn't have a lot of money, was to condense those accounts down. So now she only has eight instead of 12, and that made her feel a lot better right now. Oh, yeah, that's progress. Bernadette Joy, thank you so much. Valuable insight. You're welcome. All right, well, right now on our website, WCNC.com, we have a section dedicated to economic needs during the pandemic. We can send you a direct link to all of that information. Just text the word money to 704-329-3600. Housing advocates are bracing for a surge in evictions in North Carolina now that the state's ban on evictions will end soon. WCNC Charlotte Defender Savannah Levins has more on why experts predict a new and crippling crisis is on the horizon. North Carolina's eviction moratorium implemented to protect renters struggling financially during the pandemic expired June 20th. That same week, Google searches for eviction notice in North Carolina skyrocketed. Landlords now able to begin eviction proceedings against tenants who have been unable to pay. Whenever the moratorium for the state actually ended last month, we started seeing an insane uptick uh, in eviction. Jillian Seacrease with Winston-Salem-based Housing Justice Now says they're predicting a mass housing crisis on the horizon. People are scared. People are extremely scared. Health experts also worry an uptick in COVID cases could follow, with thousands forced to suddenly seek new shelter or become homeless. It's a public health issue. 25 U.S. cities have eviction filing rates higher than the national average. Five of those 25 are in North Carolina, including Charlotte, which pre-pandemic averaged 25 homes evicted every single day. According to U.S. Census data, as of last week, 16% of North Carolina renters said they have no confidence they'll be able to pay next month's rent. 44% only had slight or moderate confidence. National housing researchers now predicting one in five of the 110 million Americans who rent are at risk of eviction by September 30th, 2020. Meanwhile, housing advocates on both the state and national level are pushing for new programs and scrambling to help those who are days or hours from being out on the street. There's resources out there within advocacy and people that are wanting to help. Savannah Levins, WCNC Charlotte. So Savannah joins us live again. And Savannah, is the state or U.S. Congress considering any legislation right now that could help? Yep, they are. Uh, right now, there is a proposal actually to extend the eviction moratorium. However, it's getting a little bit of pushback from uh, landlord lobbies because obviously these landlords are saying, hey, we need to make money too. So that's kind of stalled. There's also a House proposal that's stuck in the Senate right now that would put billions of dollars, I think it's $100 billion, into uh, housing assistance programs nationwide. That's also kind of stalled right now. And finally, housing advocates are really pushing for Congress to extend that extra $600 a week uh, in pandemic unemployment benefits, which right now is set to expire at the end of the month. So housing advocates really pushing to extend that so people uh, can continue to pay their rent. But really between the people who can't afford their rent and the landlords who need income too, it's just a lose-lose situation and it's going to be wait and see for now, Sarah. All right, Savannah, thank you. Fred, over to you. Okay, Sarah and Savannah, thank you. A Charlotte car dealer is bracing for a a new wave of people seeking to sleep in his parking lot as the pandemic moves into another month. An average of 15 cars a night have been parking at Kiplin Automotive after hours since he made the offer in January. The people are homeless, but most of them have jobs like the two women you are about to meet. And now with new federal unemployment benefits set to expire at the end of this month, he expects a tidal wave of more people who need help. I just couldn't believe it. I talked to Karen Davis just days before COVID-19 shut down the world. I take out my blanket, and this is where I freshen up. So I've had to wash my face or brush my teeth. The one-time volunteer for the homeless had been living in her car for a year. I was hearing their stories, and then that their story became my story. In the blink of an eye, her $45,000 a year job was gone. 
and I was involved in a car accident where a drunk driver hit me at 100 miles per hour from the back. Next came an eviction, a homeless shelter, and months moving her car from place to place. When you're in your car, do you ever fear for your safety? You're praying that someone doesn't break in your car. You're praying that someone doesn't, while you sleep, take your car and take you hostage or, you know, or your life being in danger. Until she came here to Kiplin Automotive, like Devina Stevens, who we also met in early March. It's like, it's a godsend to me. She fell behind on rent between jobs and hasn't been able to recover or find housing. And it's getting harder and harder every year, and it's kind of not fair. It's like nobody listens, nobody wants to, you know, nobody wants to hear. Owner James Charles heard the challenge loud and clear. He's helped 10 people go from living in their cars to finding a home, a prospect that's increasingly expensive and fraught with red tape. At $1,200 a month rent, and you have to be making three times that, 90% of our customers wouldn't even get into that. He fears it's only going to get worse the longer people are out of work and once the courts resume eviction hearings. How do people react when they find out you're living in your car? I mean, it's like I'm invisible. And it's, a, it's the worst feeling ever. A lot of times you feel like you're nobody. It's not all about bad choices. People are really trying and people are really trying to focus and, and keep things paid. But it's hard when you don't feel like you have, a, you know, the city that you live in, that you pay, you know, pay taxes in behind you, or at least to have services. We need to make, as a city, an intentional decision. And if that, if, if we do that, I'm 100% I'm sure we'll fix it. Fortunately, Karen and Davina have been able to keep their jobs while they live in their cars. They're two of the people James has recently helped find housing. If you want to help, you can contact Kiplin Automotive through their Facebook page. There's also a GoFundMe set up to help with housing assistance. And James is starting a nonprofit called Halo Now. Still to come, if you need a little help paying your next round of bills, there are resources out there. We're going to walk you through what you need to know coming up next. And welcome back. Nate joins us again. So, Nate, I'm curious to know, you're a journalist, you're a guy who goes through a lot of data. What does this reporting look like from your end? Where do you get all this information from? So I, the, one of the, the most important things I did for, for me personally, my career several years ago, is learn how to use Excel and how to use Microsoft Access. And it really is not that complicated once you commit to it for a couple of days and then you use it. But what you find, you, you have all of these records that are basically, as you've described before, they're kind of like paper but online. And they're in a spreadsheet form, and then you're able to quickly, you know, find out what the story is. And and, and when we we're looking at how few Black-owned businesses received paycheck protection loans, uh, we click, quickly found out just by doing a couple little actions in Excel that they really were disproportionately affected by this. So I I just I love data. I love public records. I don't think um, enough people know how to use them, and that's why my job's so important. I think because I know how to use it, and I have access to them. And this is my full-time job, so I better be every day looking for this information to help the public understand, to let the light in, because otherwise this stuff stays in the dark. And you've done some reporting on unemployment as well, too. What have you found there? Well, let's go back to an Excel document. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the federal government actually has a performance measure for states about how timely they are when it comes to unemployment benefits. And what we found by looking at the data is that the three months before the pandemic, in the first three months of this year, which is the start of the pandemic in March, North Carolina was the worst state in the United States for getting out timely unemployment benefits. And what we've, we've heard from people is that it's just a mess whenever they call. Now, I will tell you, I was flowed for one week and I filed for unemployment for that one week and my payment came in eight days. You know, that's just how it happened for me. But in, in other people's cases, they are waiting for weeks upon weeks. There was a woman that I helped this week who got her $9,000 the day that we reached out to the state on her behalf. She had been waiting for weeks. She actually was unemployed in January before the pandemic and then also lost seasonal work. Um, and, and then I talked to a, a CMS school bus driver this week who filed weeks ago and, and, and the state still hasn't given her employer the paperwork to verify her claim. So wow. I think the state has tried to add a lot of people and they have, but let's remember these people are not state employees. I mean, they're contract employees, a lot of them. They, they've kind of looked at their resources to try to 
help answer the call. But what you find is when you escalate the call, if, if you don't escalate to the right person, and a lot of times it's just luck, you're in trouble. You're going to keep waiting. And meanwhile, these people need the money. You know, this bus driver, she just got the news this week that, you know, there's going to be two weeks of in-person learning to start the school year. She doesn't have a job. She worked 40 hours a week and she's not getting her unemployment and it's just taking forever. And, and a lot of these claims are simple and a simple claim, by the way, should take seven days on average. Nate, we'll pick up on that in a moment. More questions for Bill. Let's back over to Fred. From so many of you who are having a tough time paying bills, Bill McGinty got a look at what options are available to you through local charities. Americans are tough and resilient for a variety of reasons, and we don't always like to ask for help, even when we need it. With 21 million people out of work and some slowly going back over the summer, people are having a tough time paying their bills. That's where charitable help comes in. It's really been a difficult time for a lot of families here in Charlotte. Liana Humphrey is with Crisis Assistance Ministry in Mecklenburg County. So since the beginning of the pandemic, we have helped uh, more than 1,800 families remain stably housed, um, and that's to the tune of over a million dollars in aid that we've distributed. So if you are one of those people in need, these questions might be popping in your head right now. One, how much can I get? And two, for how long can I get it? We will assess each person based on their individual circumstances. So it's not always the same answer for everyone who comes by. We will look at their individual situation, the loss of income that they may have experienced, the other expenses that they have, as well as we manage a number of different funds. And so we look at sort of which ones they qualify for and we'll try to help them. And what about privacy? Not everybody admits or wants to admit they need help. Just so you know, no one will know. Everything is kept confidential. And let's flip the script for a minute. What if you're employed and weathering this storm okay? How can you help others? Certainly have had donors who've said, you know, I got a stimulus check, but I've been fortunate and still have a job. I don't need it. Let me help somebody else who might be in greater need. Well, a Charlotte woman waiting three months for her unemployment benefits reached out to the WCNC Charlotte Defenders asking, where's the money? Tonight, she tells our Alex Shabad her case was solved just 24 hours after our investigation exposing problems with the state's unemployment system. If there was ever a time a single email changed someone's life. It is a miracle. Margaret Rossetti says this would be it. The money was in my account today. The email from the North Carolina Department of Commerce saying they've reversed their initial decision and she is now eligible for unemployment benefits. I just stared at it. I, this actually happened. And um, you didn't hear the screaming from where you are? <laughs> the travel agent first applied for benefits in March after she says her business took a major hit. Since she's self-employed, her claim was transferred to the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance Program, or PUA. I had been in contact with DES every day. And in May, she received this letter denying her benefits. I... I don't know where to go next. She appealed the decision denying her benefits, but then was forced to wait several more weeks. You had the story on the news Tuesday night at 11, and in less than 24 hours, everything was resolved. Our investigation found that while many people are struggling to get paid from unemployment benefits during the pandemic, others were overpaid just last year, according to a state audit of fiscal year 2019. They've got to keep better records. A department spokesman telling us they're taking several steps to improve the current system, including having a team of experts that focus on resolving the oldest and most complicated claims, allowing people to get status updates online and by phone, and increasing the number of people working on claims issues. I can see a light at the end of the tunnel because the money came in. A department spokesman says they were able to resolve some software compatibility issues and resume cross-matching to help identify overpayments since July of last year. In Charlotte, Alex Shabbat, WCNC Charlotte. Alex, thank you. And right now on our website, WCNC.com, we have a section dedicated to unemployment. We can send you a direct link to all of that information. Just text the word unemployment to 704-329-3600. Coming up after the break, help for small businesses. The students who are streamlining the PPP process, getting cash to business owners fast. 
Welcome back online. We're joined again by the WCNC defenders. They're really your defenders, uh, Bill McGinty and Nate Morabito. Uh, Bill, we had some questions online. Sparkle Marie says she filed her tax return in February, still waiting on her refund. I think we're hearing quite a bit of that, aren't we? Yeah, that, that sounds like a typical tax refund issue that somebody might have every year. Um, you know, I understand just based on James, some of the conversations you've had with her is that she's been trying to actually use the phone to call. But don't forget everybody that that just like you're at home, I'm at home, Nate right there is at home. Uh, the IRS too is at home. And so you're trying to actually get through on the phone to somebody that isn't even in their office and all the phones are being forwarded to their homes. You, you might have better luck. Why don't you just email me at bmcginty at wcnc.com and then I will get it to the IRS through the media channels that we have available to us. Maybe they can track it down. I'll have to correspond with you a little bit if you're still watching this live stream. Uh, personally, Sparkle Marie, I think James, yeah, that, that's what you said right. her name was. Uh, I'll have to uh, get some personal information that I, I wouldn't want uh, talked about here, but that will help me track down your refund um, or any problems with it. Okay, so B. McGinty is how we're going to go about uh, handling that case. And so we don't send a thousand messages into Bill's inbox, although we'd love to. We want to let you know that on WCNC.com slash money, we have a bunch of helpful resource guides. So if you have a different issue, we have some frequently asked questions that we have answered. Savannah talked about them a little bit earlier. There's also a form so that you can contact us and let us know uh, if there is an issue that we have left unanswered that we can then go and seek that answer for you. Uh, Nate, you've been doing a lot of that type of work, people reaching out to you with problems and finding answers. And uh, I'm wondering what that response has been like. Well, I'm, I'm going to tell you, like, I think things have improved slightly. I haven't been handling the stimulus check issue. That's kind of been in, in Savannah's wheelhouse a little bit. I know Bill's been helping out with that. I've been focusing on unemployment and PPP. And I can tell you, several weeks ago, I interviewed a lawmaker who said that things were so bad at that point, in North Carolina at least, that even lawmakers and the media really couldn't make that much of a difference. They were so overwhelmed. I mean, it was just incredible. But you know what? We've been chipping away at these. At these, And you know, I, I'll tell everyone that I talked to, you know, I can't promise that we're going to be able to make a difference, but we sure are going to try. And I know we've had some success stories. And just this week, we had one. And I think sometimes... You just got to get the right person and we have the access. So this is their job to answer our questions, to answer your questions. And I know they're overwhelmed. I know they're trying hard. We get that. But you know what? No one should be falling through the cracks, especially right now. We got to find a way to make sure these people get their money. Their life depends on it. Well, let us be those liaisons for you. Let's head back over to the studio. Harvard MBA students are making the PPP loan application process for small business owners easier. WCNC Charlotte's Brianna Harper shows us where's the money for thousands of self-employed workers still in need. Nearly four months and counting. The coronavirus pandemic continues to harm health and punish the pockets of those working on their own. We realize that independent contractors and small businesses are disproportionately affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. That's where Shrey Kapoor and Chris Nikopoulos, classmates and MBA students at Harvard, decided to join forces to help others navigate the process of securing PPP, the Federal Paycheck Protection Program. We not only make it accessible, but we help with awareness. Over the weekend, President Trump signed into law an extension to apply for small business loan assistance. And all you need is about 20 minutes of your time, a 2019 tax return, and some guidance through FinGig if you're having any trouble. We walk them through step by step. This is exactly how you apply. We work with the lender. And uh, then hopefully in a week or two after we speak to them, they, they get their, their government aid. The assistance through FinGig is completely voluntary based. And so far, the founders say they've helped about 400 self-employed workers get the government money many so desperately need. And we're told there's still plenty of money to go around. There's over $130 billion. That's billion with a B. But the biggest issue has always been the sheer volume of applications. And with the help of FinGig, it pays off to follow up often and keep your money making options open. We normally recommend our clients to apply through multiple lenders 
because uh, every lender takes its own time to process applications. A lot of small businesses that need help and uh, it's, it's the least we could do. And the deadline for small businesses to apply for government aid is August 8th. Now, if you're interested but need a little help, just visit our website, wcnc.com, where there'll be information with the link as well as contact information to reach FinGig. Brianna Harper reporting, WCNC, Charlotte. Tonight, Consumer Reporter Bill McGinty is trying to help several viewers navigate refunds for concerts, but we're hitting roadblocks. Bill here now with their stories and some consumer advice. Seeing the Piano Man is on John Martell's bucket list. He paid over $800 for two tickets for a concert that was scheduled for April 2020 in Uptown. I love that type of music, you know, I, I was in the 70s and 80s. Yeah. Born in the late 50s, and I absolutely just love that type of music. But then COVID hit. The Billy Joel concert now scheduled for April 2021, and refunds are tough to come by. John's not sure if he can go then and isn't sure if he wants to be in a crowd that big even then. So he called Ticket Smarter, where he bought them. At first, she was very compassionate. She said, oh, Mr. Martell, I understand. Um, we're, we're issuing refunds. Stand by. Then she came back. And she was like, uh, Dr. Jekyll and Mrs. Hyde. She said, we did nothing wrong. You're not getting your money back. And that was, I mean, pretty much quote. I emailed that same company through their portal, but nothing back concerning Mr. Martell's case. Their voicemail says refunds are available for canceled events. Billy Joel was just rescheduled. It's a beautiful Jackie Canarek was supposed to see Michael Bublé back in March. And I was so thrilled, and it was our anniversary, and we were going to go to a fancy restaurant and book the limo, the whole nine yards. But the Crooners concert was scrubbed as well because of COVID. This event rescheduled for next year, too. Jackie bought through Ticket Center and wants money back because in a year, well, anything can change. But she, too, is having trouble when she's asking for a refund. So I asked to speak to a supervisor. And the supervisor took me 45 minutes to get hold of the supervisor, very nasty. And I said, well, I'm going to call my credit card company and I'm going to call Bill McGinty. These events can be dicey and very, very slow. A quick tidbit of advice here. When you're looking at concerts and events like this, buy from companies you have experience with. Always use a credit card and always ask about the refund policy up front. Get everything in writing. And if you don't like what you're starting to hear, shop elsewhere. And we're glad they called Bill because we just got a hold of John before this special and he told us he finally got his money back. Mm. And we ask you how the coronavirus has affected your job. 37% of you say you stayed the same. 28% now work from home. 22% lost their job and 14% are furloughed. We do want to thank you for joining us for this special edition of WCNC Charlotte. And remember our website, WCNC.com, we have a section dedicated to economic needs during the pandemic. We hope to see you back here at 11. And if you missed any part of tonight's special, you can rewatch it on demand on the WCNC Charlotte YouTube channel. Keep those questions and comments coming. Our resource guides are available to you at WCNC.com slash money. Bill, Nate, back with us once more. Uh, gentlemen, some uh, closing thoughts, and we'll start with Nate. Well, I'll tell you what. When we're back at the TV station, it's usually Bill, Alex Shabbat, and I. And I think what, like for me, what what brings the fire out in me. And I think that it's fair to say with the rest of us, I know Bill and I have talked about it sitting there in the desk back when we did is helping people. Like that is the most important job that we can, we can really have here is to help people. And if there was ever a time to help people, this is it. And I know we're trying, like this is pretty much what we're dedicated to right now. There's a couple of side stories I do here and there, but this is what we're focused on. Every email that I get personally, I respond to. And, and we're going through to make sure no one that that reaches out to us gets ignored. So the bottom line is we just want to help and, and we can't always help, but we're certainly going to try. 
Yeah, let me just jump on that. Um, you know, we're a great resource. We're here for you. Certainly, we want to emphasize that. But uh, one of the things we need you to do is when you send us an email, make it easier for us so that we can dive right in and we don't have to exchange four or five emails back and forth to get the necessary information so that we can forward your claim on, whether it be to the IRS or to the North Carolina Unemployment. You know, when you email us, include your claim numbers. Um, I'm not wild about saying blindly include your social security number, but I know in past I have asked for that, especially when it's going to the IRS. What it does is all this information helps them, whether it be at the state or the federal government, track down your claim and your information in your case a heck of a lot faster. And that's going to get a faster result. So, uh, you know, if you think about that, when you reach out to us, include all the necessary information, screenshots, documentation, emails you've had with people, names, phone numbers, contact information, all that kind of stuff, because that makes our job a whole lot easier. And, and if our job is easier, you're going to get what you want a whole lot quicker. Some good advice and uh, appreciate your extra time with us online tonight, Bill, Nate, Savannah, and to all of you at home who have watched with us online, WCNC.com, download our mobile app for more coverage of Where's the Money. Our special tonight has come to an end, but our commitment and coverage to you hasn't. You can find it 24 hours a day at WCNC.com or, of course, on WC. NC Charlotte Television. So on behalf of the entire WCNC Charlotte news team, I'm James Briarton from the digital side of things. Thanks for hanging out with us here on social, and we will see you back at 11 o'clock on WCNC Have Charlotte. Good night, everybody. Night.